Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to Living the Solution with Dr. Elena George. Today we have one of my favorite guests on and somebody who I respect highly is going to come and speak to us about a topic that we have discussed before, but I don't think there's any, there's, there's always something new about this topic. And I, I want to get all perspectives so that we can really get a handle on it. And again, we're going to be speaking about uh, literally transhumanism and spirituality and Christianity. I mean, my first thought is that they don't, they don't mix. It's not really possible to be uh, humanism or, or have humanism as your, your baseline and also be Christian. But I want to get Dr. Garwood's uh, take on that. So today, again, we're speaking with, with uh, Reverend Dr. Jason Garwood. He spent his career seeking to both understand and apply the biblical worldview to every single area of life. His aim is to help pastors and churches to be better equipped to engage in the Great Commission by teaching Christians how to find their individual purpose in the kingdom of God and learn how to identify and respond to cultural idols. He's a husband and a father, and he's also an author. His most recent book is The Politics of Humanism, Reconstructing the Heart and Health for All of Life. He also writes for several outlets, and he's the host of Cross and Crown Radio. He's a teaching pastor of Cross and Crown Church in Northern Virginia. And Dr. Garwood, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I think our conversation is going to be from a Christian perspective, from someone who is a real thinker about it. And so I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, thank you, Dr. George. It's a, it's a blessing to be back with you. I really enjoyed our time. I think we spoke last year um, in, in sort of the pandemic mode of things. And, and it was always a, uh, that was a good time and it was a blessing and I appreciate your work. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. You wrote a book that's extremely timely, uh, The Politics of Humanism. And first, I'm, you've, you're a, a critical thinker. It's obvious to me. And my question is, what brought you to this topic? I know it's out there. It's being bandied about, about the next best thing and how everybody can just move towards this and everybody will be, everything will be wonderful. But what made you finally really put this out there and in a thinking manner from a Christian perspective? Sure. Yeah, great question, because I, I I suppose the book in its earliest form was actually a sermon series that I preached. And the book came out in 2020. But as you mentioned, I think it's as relevant today as it ever was <laughs> because of the trajectory of culture and how things are going. Um, but what really prompted me to, to write the book was because as a Christian pastor, as someone who uh, desires to shepherd God's people to help them grow in holiness and uh, to help them walk through, you know, the Christian life and those sorts of things. There's also this other side, though, of pastoral ministry that not only are you tending to the sheep, but you're also fighting against the wolves. <laughs> and as you see the culture in this bedraggled mess that it's in right now. I began to think, okay, there, there is an answer to these things. And some of my theological convictions I've already had for several years, just about how the Bible is authoritative on everything of which it speaks, and it speaks of everything. That's a famous quote from Dr. Cornelius Van Til. And so I began to just really want to dissect our culture and say, okay, what are the underpinnings here? What are the, the, these different topics that are out there, you know, war and immigration, education, uh, you name the topic, even the topic of racism and critical race theory, which has obviously been a huge discussion for the past couple of years, along with the pandemic. Uh, what about uh, uh, sexuality, human sexuality and socialism and all these isms that are out there? Does the Bible give us an answer? And you start to look and peel back behind those worldviews and what it is they're saying. And you realize, wait, you know, they're going off the rails here. They have a bad view of the world. You know, they don't have the Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's as well as its fullness, the world and all those who dwell in it. They don't have that worldview, but also they have a pretty aberrant view of man and who is man? What is man? What are, what is uh, our purpose here? 
and all of our relationships and all of those things and how they uh, work together and what is the role of civil government and all these things just sort of blend together. And I just dissected them, looked at the, the problems that are underneath all of those things and realized, well, yeah, it's humanism. That's probably the best way to describe it. It's a view of man that elevates man over against God and what God says. And it is in everything. It's in it's in healthcare. It's in science. It's uh, in education. The whole gamut of culture has been polluted by this false religion is really what it is. It's the religion of fallen man. And that's one of the opening chapters. So that, that was how it all began. I just looked around and said, we have problems. Let's dig into those. That's a, that's a, a huge topic. I mean, I think you've touched on a lot of these isms. And what I think they also tie in is this divide and conquer mentality. And this, you know, humanism is kind of, it's kind of schizophrenic in a way, isn't it? If men are supposed to be their own God, but they're subservient to, to the animal kingdom, right? Everything is, man is, should be basically removed. We're the virus, we're the cancer of, of the world, right? The earth is yep. also more important than we are. Right. You mentioned uh, earlier about, you used the phrase transhumanism, which is actually the age that we're walking into. Um, I'm not even fully convinced necessarily that postmodernism is a thing. Modernism struggled between these two separate poles in philosophy. They're called dialectics. One was the, the fixed reality of nature and the laws of science. You know, the scientific re revolution really opened that up for us. But then the other pole, the other side is freedom, the autonomy of man, the post-enlightenment. Man can be whoever he wants to be. A man is a measure of all things, which goes back even to Greek thought. And we sort of shifted now. Now it's when it's convenient, we'll talk about science. But then when it's when we want to be free to say that there are 52 plus genders and all of these other things come in, we're, we're sort of shifting into this freedom mode where we just do whatever our autonomous hearts want to do. And but we're, we're entering into that age of transhumanism where all of the humanistic impulses are still there, man desiring to be his own God. It's the same stuff from the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, epistemology is the study of how we know things. And, and the same problem that Adam and Eve experienced, we're seeing people today experience, where there's no knowledge uh, above us in the heavens. There's no knowledge revealed to us. As Christians, we believe in uh, what's called revelational epistemology. God has revealed himself to us. That's how we can know things, and we can be sure about those things because God is who he is, and he's given us his word, and he's given us this world to open up and explore and learn and, and study. And um, But the transhumanism wants to get rid of all of any, any shred of evidence where God might be. They, they would like to destroy that and move on with it uh, through places like the World Economic Forum, you know, the Great, great Reset stuff. I know you're up to speed on that, <laughs> all of these things. People, people want to move past any shred of evidence that, of Western civilization being built on, on Christianity and its principles. They can't exist. They, they realize that they can't exist together because they would lose. I think it's trying to create a playing field what's not even. And if you remove all knowledge, in which they try to do from school, from society, references to God, references to Christianity, and I, it seems to be a real assault against what being Christian is. And it's trying to define it from outside in. And before the, when we come back from the break, I, I would just get, love to get your take on why Christians are allowing ourselves to be defined and to stand down and to just let this meme and this mindset take flight because it's not safe. And on that note, let's take our first break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with the Reverend Dr. Jason Garwood. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Bible from Cairn University. He has a Master's of Divinity from Missio Seminary, and he's got his Doctor of Theology from Hope Seminary. And before the break, we were speaking about this, this movement towards uh, removing God from our culture. And I, as a pastor, I'm sure you've probably seen this. I feel this that we're just allowing people, the society, the 
social mores to demonize Christians. Everything's the fault of Christians and they need to be removed. And you can say whatever you want about Christians, but no other, no other group. And it just seems like it's just left. And these, this energy, this negative energy being thrust upon us is not being thwarted. I would love to get your take on that. Sure. The, the, probably the most palatable thing I can think of is the most recent uh, huge, huge news about Roe v. Wade and it being overruled. And we saw the fallout from that. The, uh, this quote unquote left, uh, who is very much pro infanticide, pro abortion, you know, you got Senator uh, Warren trudging through the streets uh, on her way to the Capitol building, outraged, and, and other people who are just outraged by this. And they've decided to frame the question in different terms. And, and uh, you know, definitions don't seem to matter any other day, but now they do. And so that's the most palatable thing I can think of most recently. And if you go back even to the Roe v. Wade decision, which was given to us by Republican appointed justices, frankly, and the majority, and you see the carnage that's left in the wake of, of the abortion infanticide of our nation, um, you know, you have to, you have to stop and wonder, man, what, where has the church been? Mm -hmm. And even, even the pro, I don't really call myself pro-life. I'm an abolitionist, I believe in the total abolition of abortion. Uh, I think that's a more biblical consistent answer. People can look up abolition 101.com if they want to find out more what that is. But, um, even even the, the pro-lifers don't want to be consistent. They they want to say, you know, you, you can you know murder a baby at 22 weeks or after or before or when, whenever you know these these bills that are get pushed. But but I'm bringing this up because Christians have just failed to be consistent. We have not had a comprehensive holistic view of the world. Something that Psalm 19 gives us. I just preached a message on that recently, and. We haven't had a comprehensive view of the world. We haven't had a compre comprehensive view of the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and don't forget his ascension as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We have retreated from the public square. We, we think the church's business is only to deal with things of faith. And we've allowed the culture, uh, I know that's kind of an incohate <laughs> you know, phraseology, but you know what I mean. We've mm -hmm. allowed the quote unquote culture to basically dictate the terms and conditions of what civil government looks like, what justice looks like, what education should look like. And, and that's really no fault but the church. And I want to speak favorably of the church because it is the bride of Christ. He bled for her and he intends to redeem her. Absolutely. But we need to really repent of our apathy of allowing uh, Christianity to be removed from the, from the town square. And that's what I, our recent nonprofit I started, the Virginia Center for Public Theology, is defending those Christian ethics in the town square. Uh, because we have something to say about everything, because this is God's world, they're breathing God there. And we want them to, to come to a knowledge of the truth, uh, you know, first and foremost, before any cultural change happens. We're not revolutionaries. Uh, that the unbelief applied to politics is the, the French Revolution stuff. We don't want that. We want change. But we want to win the hearts and minds of people, but it's very difficult when we're not out there engaging with those issues. It seems to be this is another domino in the in the corporatization of our society. Healthcare has been corporatized. Seems that religion is also has with the monies that pour in from the government. And when when did it stop being? people giving alms or giving tithes in their own church and having government money pour in, that seems to have been the um, a turning point. Certainly was for healthcare, where follow the money <laughs> always comes into play. Yeah. If you want to have um, a response and a behavior, you reward it. And if you're not, there's no skin in the game, you're just getting paid. It's very easy to take your hands off the wheel and let somebody guide it. It seems that is, well, let me ask a question. Is that what happened in terms of religion, do you think? I think so. I think it's a fair assessment. Absolutely. When you farm out your responsibilities, because that's that's really the heart of, of what we're talking about here with individuals and, and churches and families taking responsibility for the things that God has given them the authority to, to carry out, to execute. Uh, education belongs to the family. It does not belong to the state. Um, safety and security, that's the biggest idol I think I could point to, where we, where we farm out that 
to the state, whether that's the things like the Patriot Act or uh, any other legislation that comes after, instead of us taking care of ourselves, which just seems like kind of what you were hinting at there and saying, it, it seems like it's just easier for someone else to do it. You know, the, the government, the taxation that we're under right now, I mean, they, you know, they threw tea in the harbor over less. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're being suffocated by statism, which is the great idol of humanism. And I, I think we have, we have given ourselves over to, to given, given those responsibilities over to the state, whether that's, you know, the, the, the tithe of the church going to fund education, going to help fund uh, you know, the single mother, speaking of the Roe thing, all of a sudden people are saying, well, where's the church? You better be ready to adopt. What do you think we've been doing for 2000 years? <laughs> we did it for, in the Roman empire. We adopt children. We invented the thing called the hospital. <laughs> you know, we've been, we've been after it. No humanist Stalin regime ever came up with those types of, you know, <laughs> no. care for, for people. Well, when you put it in those terms, it makes me think of, all these isms as a mechanism to shut people up and also to push this through without resistance. When you think of immigration, for example, it's kind of uh, cynical that people coming in are getting, churches are getting paid to, to house people. I mean, it's a money-making venture in some instances. So is it really all about altruism? Is it really that this is what Jesus would do that they claim? Or is it money pouring in? All right, you know, what's the underlying underpinning of this? It, it's bigger than yeah. we think. Instead of people being shouted down as being the worst people in the world, people really need to take a step back and look at it. Because there's nothing like giving because it's from your heart. That's real. This is a little bit, uh -huh. it's somebody's making money on this. And, and it's on the backs of somebody else while you, you, cower people, you know, based on being called names, it's just not right. I mean, it, how do we dis, disengage ourselves from this? Yeah, I think it starts with recapturing the standards of God. What does God's word say? That, that's really what I did with the book was just take what does God's word say to these issues? And that is a goal because I realized some of those topics, like you brought up immigration, uh, the same money issue went on with the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, nonprofits and churches, we shut you down, but you can apply for these grants and we'll give you money. And where did that come from? I mean, you know, we're, we're, we wonder why the gas is so high now and, and, and inflation is so high. Sure, there are policies of the left that contribute to that. But when you print trillions of dollars of money to respond to your own thing that you created, the government, <laughs> federal mm -hmm. government, then, you know, of course you're going to create a, the, the wreckage of culture that we see right now, economically especially. And what you, what you said about the heart, that's, that's the center of Christianity. The center of Christianity is a restoration of the religious direction of a man's life. Because all of life is religious. And when you don't have the standards of God in place to get you to a certain goal, then you're willing to compromise along the way. You're willing to compromise on, on, on these types of things. You know, the, the whole welfare system as well. I'm all for helping people, but that used to be the church's job. It used to be the community pulling together and, and helping, you know, uh, Farmer Joe, whose barn burned down, everybody got together and helped rebuild it, you know, and that used to be a thing. And we've lost that because we have, we don't care about God's standards as much. And it's just easier to file some paperwork and get, get the unemployment, you know, and, and it's difficult to untangle that knot. You know, that cake has been baked for a long time, the statism cake. It's hard to unbake it. It's hard to, to pull everything out that needs to be pulled out. But I think that if we're honest, if, if the Church of Jesus Christ that professes the true religion of the biblical gospel, if we can re repent before God and seek to do his will, you know, via his standards, then I think we can recover a lot of that. And we can start to see statism go away and we can start to win people's minds um i don't know if i have much time for this quick story but i saw a thing where these women they're uh, leftist liberal type women got together they're mad at the hookup culture they're mad at the quote-unquote rape culture and they got together i don't know if the story's real but i saw it i saw it somewhere on the internet and they said you know we're gonna make a pact we're not gonna we're not going to get with a man until he's ready to marry us and sign a contract <laughs> and provide for us and take care of us and our baby. And, and the joke was, well, 
welcome to traditional marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something as simple as that, you know, just have godly families with children who love Jesus and are, are know how to find their purpose in the kingdom of God. And, and boy, I really think we could change things. We could see the heart of the nation change because the hearts of the people are changing. I, I couldn't have said it better. And just to backtrack on what we talked about with the welfare system, I mean, really, was it designed, if you really, you know, break this thing apart, was it designed to, rem- to get rid of the family? Because in order to have uh, benefits, you had to say you didn't know where the father was. That was like a setup. You were paying mm-hmm. people to have children out of, out of wedlock. You were paying to have these fragmented communities. And, you know, as the money goes, that's how the behavior goes. And now we're reaped, we've reaped what that sowed. It's kind of interesting, that story, because if that's what, it's gone to such a, the pendulum has swung so far that people are really, it's an eye-opening experience. And maybe this is a, maybe we're on coming back towards the center, towards God, I hope. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I, I don't know how bad things have to get before we actually turn 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 our faces to the ground and say god please do not smite us <laughs> because we have blasphemed your name and, and and that's really that's the preacher side of me where i i really want people who are listening to really consider you know the truths of god's word and the beauty of god's world and the culture that we get to produce and, and the things we get to enjoy uh, all for the glory of god um, he has as psalm 23 says he's he's prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Um, we get to dine with Christ. We get to be with him. We're united with him. And if we will just simply cast ourselves upon him, uh, I really think that there could be a massive change, sweeping change, like never seen before. To uh, From your lips to God's ears. And I think part of that change is not living in fear, not letting somebody uh, determine your, your fate. I mean, taking your power back because you know there's a bigger picture, because this doesn't matter. because Doing the right thing for, for God's reason outweighs everything that comes at you in this world. On that note, let's take our second break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with the Reverend Dr. Jason Garwood, and you can reach him at jasongarwood.com, crosscrownchurch.com, and as he mentioned before, abolition101.com. And, you know, Dr. Garwood, what you said, it just, it's so empowering because it's just, it gives you perspective. What, I mean, you just don't live in fear when you know that if you're with God and God's with you, nothing, this stuff just, it just doesn't touch you really, does it? Right, right. That The rest of Psalm 23 says as much. Uh, I will fear no evil. You know, the whole point of Psalm 23 is that verse 4, where the presence of God is a great comfort to us. And we have to have the eyes of faith, of course. And faith doesn't bury its head in the sand and refuse to look at the world. It just simply looks at the world through the eyes of of, of Scripture, the eyes of faith, Um, being able to judge rightly, as uh, 1 Corinthians 2 tells us. Um, So it, it 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 seems like a dire, very disheveled culture, and it is in a lot of ways. Um, but I do believe that the gospel is power. It is the power of God unto salvation, Romans tells us. Well, in the book, you talk about uh, various topics, and you know, humanism is one of them. And how does things? We talked a bit about immigration, but racism. How do you think that's being used as a weapon now in our society? Sure, it's 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 well. First and foremost, especially the, the, the aberrant uh, critical race theory aspects that are being used to bludgeon uh, people into some sort of, uh, of guilt, um, no doubt America's history has been stained uh, with, with treating African Americans as lesser than human. Uh, same, same, same thing we do today with uh, those who are still in the womb. And that stain, of course, is something to to consider. It's something to think about deeply. Racism, I don't, and I use the term in the book, but I'm using it because that's a that's a term of, of humanistic presuppositions anyway. Um, I prefer more biblical language uh, where we talk about ethnicities and we can certainly talk about nation states and those ideas. Um, 
And, and even that doesn't apply anyway, because you can be American and how many Americans have different, all sorts of different skin color. Right. But the issue of racism is being used today to, to really, I think, try to backfire, uh, or maybe I shouldn't say backfire, it's backfiring, yes, but it's being used to fire at the Christian worldview. And, and that, of course, is, is just erroneous thinking. Uh, if, if there is sin, then the answer is repentance and the gospel. The, the answer isn't, you know, telling everybody that, that, um, you know, you're a racist if, just because we disagree on a particular you know, mm-hmm. policy, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it, it's a ludicrous, really, what, what we see happening. Um, and no doubt there's hatred that people have in their hearts toward people that are not like them. That, that is a thing. I mean, no doubt that's a thing. Uh, but on the other hand, it's it's not. You you would think that this this nation is just bigoted and racist. Everybody who would consider themselves Christian and on on the so called right, you know, you're just you're just must be a racist. And and I just it, you're you're starting with wrong categories, and therefore you're going to have wrong conclusions. And I I think there are things that we do need to deal with in the book. I, I think I've been called a cultural Marxist for this, which is just absurd to me. <laughs> But, you know, the black church, for example, exists because the white church didn't want the blacks in church. <laughs> like, you know, there, there's history there. there. I think we have to be honest about those things. And I think there are things that we can do, especially as Christians, to lead the way in 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 those interactions um, with with whether it's white, black, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. Whatever the cultural differences are, or, um, I think we can deal with those things. But but today it's really very much used as a weapon to to basically silence people that you disagree with. And and I've always said it best that the the uh, intolerance of those who cry for tolerance is intolerable. That's really well said. <laughs> very well said. I mean, from the standpoint of the well, the cultural Marxist movement or the mindset. It's really the opposite of inclusivity and diversity. It's very unipolar and totalitarian in its in its makeup and its tone. And if again, if we know where we stand and we're standing with God, does that give us power to withstand this and to not allow this this uh, voice to define us? And you know, I find with bullies, as soon as you stand up to them, they stop. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I, I think that that's. I guess it kind of goes back to what we were saying or, uh, beforehand in one of the break before one of the breaks there, just that the, the definitions matter and how we define things matters and how we then engage a world that is very much confused about the dictionary uh, is going to require some semblance of winsomeness. Uh, wise as serpents, innocent as doves, Jesus says. And no matter the topic, it doesn't matter that the issue. Being able to to engage that is going to require at least some semblance of de- determination, grit, uh, being willing to be spat upon. I mean, I've been <laughs> spat upon by pro aborts and mm. and uh, cursed, you know, out every name in the book. And but Jesus says, "Blessed are those who are persecuted for my righteous sake." And I don't want to just provoke the culture because it's fun, like it's a fun thing. Um, I love memes as much as the next guy, but at the end of the day, like the gospel is going to have to be proclaimed and and that's the heart of the issue. Well, it's it takes courage, doesn't it? It's it's something that you have to actively pursue, right? It's not something that you can just let happen, is it? Right, and it requires discipleship. Uh, it, it requires a boldness. It's, you have to know who you are and as someone who's made in God's image. Um, kind of touching on the, the racism topic again, mm-hmm. people who are made in God's image and the Christian vision is a uniting of people from all tribes, tongues, and languages, this glorious song in, in the book of Revelation, uh, where, where when the heavenly, when the new heavens and new earth is finally consummated, uh, you know, there will be this glorious, beautiful picture of humanity that Christ has redeemed. And we all look different, and we may have different accents, sound a little different, we may like different things, but we are united truly in Christ. And, uh, you know, being able to boldly and, and courageously step out into the street and step out into the front of the abortion mill. You know, we do abortion mill work as well. I've been talking with legislators here in Virginia. We're trying to get a bill of abolition of abortion here. And 
you know, I'm trying to find guys who are going to be courageous, who are willing to step up to the plate and say, we need to treat people equally under the law. And it's difficult to find, but it does require us to, to know who God is, know who we are. And those two things are connected, by the way. Uh, and then being able to trust the Holy Spirit's work as we go and, and seek to advance the gospel. Now, you know, we talked about st- statism at the beginning of the show. I, first, I, for the people who don't exactly understand or know what that is, what is statism? What do you define it as? Yeah, pronounced either way, statism, statism. Statism. Mm -hmm. Uh, The point is, though, it's the elevation of the state to what I would call an unbiblical category, meaning that the only person who has unlimited and unending jurisdiction and authority is the Lord Jesus Christ. All authority has been given to me, he says in Matthew 28. So he is the only one who has all authority. Statism is this attempt of man through government coercion to claim total jurisdiction, total authority. That's probably the most succinct definition, which is idolatry, is another way to say it. That sums it up pretty well. So so from a Christian worldview, from a Christian perspective, I mean, the Bible says, you know, we're not of this world, but for real, we're not of this. Is it not possible to serve two masters, is it? Right. And, and being not of this world, uh, referencing Jesus and his communication with Pilate in John 19, it, him, when he said that my kingdom is not of this world, he mm-hmm. just simply meant the origin is not of this world. No man gives Jesus authority. His authority is, is given from above, he tells Pilate. And so he doesn't mean that this kingdom has nothing to do with the world. He just simply means that it doesn't function the way the world functions. And but being not of this world, in that sense, you know, the Bible uses a lot of terms for world. It could just mean the system of evil. Uh, the letters of John talk a lot about that. Um, so we're not of that. We're not of this aberrant system that has, you know, for ever since the garden decided to work against God and sin and, and sin and transgression. We're not in that. We're not. We we have been renewed. We're seated in the heavenly places. We've been raised with Christ. Um, we, we think differently. We have the mind of Christ. Uh, we are walking with the spirit, those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of um, lost my train of thought a little bit, but that's okay. The, the point is, though, we, we don't, because of those things, we don't disengage. We actually ha- now have more reason to engage. That's interesting. I mean, but not be sucked in, right? That's, it's, you're engaging, but you're not allowing it to take over you, take you over, right? Right. And the, and the thought patterns that are out there that are based on humanistic presuppositions, those should not be the driving force. That was my entire frustration with mm. how the church responded to the pandemic. Instead of moving toward the, the infirm, toward the sick, that's what Florence Nightingale said about, about Jesus. She was impressed by him moving toward the sick. Instead of engaging that, well, the state has it, big pharma has it, they'll come up with a pill, a shot, you know, something that'll give you myocarditis, but who cares? Just trust them. And and, and we, we just responded poorly because we got sucked into this idea that only the elite, like Dr. Fauci, who, who should be tried for crimes against humanity, um, we, got, we just responded poorly. And it's because we weren't thinking the mind of Christ. We weren't thinking about creation-based medicine. We weren't thinking about how to take care of our bodies. We've just trusted someone else to do it. Well, I think that's probably, that's exactly what happened, but it, because it was easy and the will, or I should say the, the rhetoric was punitive. If you did speak up, if you did try to stand firm, something was going to come and knock you down. But I mean, ultimately, the choice we have the power don't we because ultimately we have to we have to choose god we have to make a decision about what what's important to us and not fall into this worldly trap whether you're going to keep your job is it really worth it if you can't survive it or you lose you know your ability to work because you've been injured in some way i mean there's a lot of things a lot of ways to think about this but let's take our last break and come back you're living in the solution Welcome back to Living the Solution. 
Um, we're speaking with Dr. Jason Garwood, and before the break, you know, it just seems to me as humans and as you know, vessels of God, you know, we're all created in His image. How can government? I mean, we technically in our government, in our uh, society, we tend we make up the government, don't we? How do we just cede our power to this entity? That's supposed to take care of everything from cradle to grave. I mean, it just seems like we've come completely left from where it was really about self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and doing things because it was God-centered. Yeah. You know, that's kind of to, this is tied in a little bit of what you had asked beforehand, before the break. When we think about um, what it means to be a Christian in this world, we're in God's world. He has a plan and a purpose for certain things. Um, and he has a plan and a purpose for the, the issue of civil government and how how that uh, how that's to be carried out. And Romans 13 uh, tells us that the, the the jurisdiction of the magistrate is to punish evil. And as I study scripture, and it's something I'm going to write on, and hopefully in the near future, uh, I see what's called a theocratic ju- judiciary, meaning that um, the executive and legislative branches of the government are actually the heavenly places. Um, the, the 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 executive is has grown and is now being groomed to essentially be a dictatorship where alphabet soup agencies can knock down your door, no knock, raid, shoot you, and oh, we got the wrong guy. You know, you, you live in this this environment where um, police are given all of this extenuating authority to just pull you over for whatever they want, and and and, and we see how that goes sometimes. And so we live in this culture where. To what you said, self-government is kind of thrown out the window, and we just have to follow the rules, keep our head down, and hopefully not run into anybody who's going to mess with this. And that's not a way to live. It's not a way to to live at all. And while I love our Constitution, and we've had a checkered history with that, again, mentioned earlier, not treating African Americans who were brought here as slaves, as people made in the image of God. And the Constitution apparently didn't stop that. And not only did, didn't it stop that, you had a Supreme Court decision, like the Dred Scott decision. And it, it, it's, it's just been a, it's been a mess. And so I'll tell you what I think about that, Dr. George, because I think this is important. Mm-hmm. As we think Christianly about this, that's the goal, right? Thinking Christianly about mm-hmm. it. The, the founding fathers, some of which are Christians, many of which are humanist deists, even Thomas Jefferson, not, in my view, not a Christian as brilliant as the man was, much of the founding fathers were influenced by men like John Locke, uh, David Hume, some of the, 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 the Western European thinkers who were basically trying to pull Christianity away from uh, sort of a sec- into a secular view of government. And the difficulty I have, and, and uh, Lysander Spooner wrote a little book about this after the Civil War, he asked the question, look, the Constitution either gave us this this mess or it was powerless to stop it. And you probably have heard the quote, too. I don't remember who this was. If it was Franklin or somebody said that basically our government presupposes a moral people. And so not only has we, have we lost the morality of it, we have chosen to run this government system where they're supposed to work for us. But in fact, we're working for the for them they're taking our money and they are spending it you know obviously luxuriously <laughs> and not in a way that's even close to godly stewardship so I, that's a huge topic but I, I think that that's been i think that's the goal of humanism the goal of humanism to, is to stamp out any any trace of christianity and establish man as the supreme one and I think our government has a lot of work to do. And I don't know if America can hang tight because right now we're seeing the, the states just rip apart on the issue of abortion, uh, especially uh, this left and right divide, which you know is very real. It's very real. It's a very difficult um, thing to navigate because you, you don't know who's next to you. That could be just completely a opposite of you politically. Mm-hmm. Christians have to be wise in, in engaging in that. Well, from the standpoint of engagement you know we're living in a i don't know safety becomes an issue you know we've got all these other variables where people seem it seems to be as i said at the beginning of the show a bit of open season so people can be hurt they can be 
you know, physically uh, assaulted, they can have their jobs taken away. How can we make that start that movement? Because I think it's you can't stand pat at this point, like we like we discussed. There has to be action and wise action, obviously. But how can how do we get that ball rolling? Is it home churches? Is it finding a, a parish or a church that is like minded? How do you make that move? Because from a the bigger picture, most of the churches are very anti <laughs> making any kind of change. Yeah. Yeah, Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of children of man is fully set to do evil. And, you know, people put their head in the sand and, and just lament or wait, wait, maybe Jesus will come and zap us off the planet. Um, we, we cannot afford to do that. Not when Jesus has given us marching orders to go and disciple the nation, to baptize them and to teach them how to obey Christ. So what to do? That's a difficult question, honestly, because you, you do have, I mean, I have my own frustration with pastors, even locally, and I, I try to, to engage them, to love them, but at, at, at the end of the day, they just do not see the culture war as anything worth fighting. And it reminds me of the Lord of the Rings uh, with Aragorn, and I forget the other man's name off the top of my head. They're talking, and he says, I will not risk open war, and Aragorn says, well, open war is upon you, whether you would risk it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's it's here. It's on your front steps. And are you going to have the courage and the boldness to do that? I do think Christians, uh, there may be a place for Christians to to uh, respectfully engage their, their pastors and, and whoever their spiritual advisor or leader is in that, in that regard. You know, different denomination, denominations have different setups. But I, I do think, though, that we, we ought to be learning how to at the grassroots level connect with with folks perhaps perhaps you do need to leave your church perhaps you've tried and, and you've just they've just failed repeatedly to lead the church church militant into the world for the kingdom for the sake of the kingdom um you know maybe you need to move we started our church crossing crown church with the idea that we would have a long-term vision long-term vision we want to see businesses started we want to see schools started we want to see education pursuits um we want to be active locally we want to make sure all our county board of supervisors know who we are who that we want the sheriff to know who we are and we want to know them to know that they are accountable to us and a lot of churches just can't think past the five next five years um, I think it's important for Christians to, to be able to have a like-minded fellowship in those regards. And, and, and it may require you move. We moved to Northern Virginia to plan. I was pastoring in Michigan, moved away. Um, we just felt like we needed to set the tone with our church from the very beginning. We've had people move from all over the country to come and join us in, in this pursuit. And and, and I, I think that sometimes that's what's called, called for. Sometimes mm -hmm. that, that's what's necessary. Sometimes you have to be really bold. and. You know, you build it, they'll come kind of mentality. The, to some degree, people are, you know, they're a bit of a follower, right? So if someone is bold enough to take that step and to show the way, it takes that, you know, that little bit of inertia, and then it's it's stream, and then it, it, before you know it, there's a lot of people who like to follow, and they're with you. But you know, I'm I am totally, I respect what you do. I think that you've you are bridging a gap between reality and God. And you're able to say it in a very non-threatening and elegant way because you have to hear the truth. It's not about, I can't say anything because somebody won't like me. It really has nothing to do with that. We need to make a jump from being popular and go along, get along, and to do what's right. Because I think once that happens, the people are standing in there just not trying to make any kind of waves when they have a choice and they can break a, a specific way, I think that most people are good and they want, they want this, they don't like this system. Nobody wants to be put upon 24 seven. And I think at this point, it's pretty obvious that we're moving in the wrong direction. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I do think people are waking up. I do think that God is a absolutely at work in the hearts and minds of people. Um, it's just, it, it's sad to me though, because if you, only if your only access to what was going on out in the world was what you discussed in church or heard from the pulpit, then 
people, Christians would not know anything about what dangers lie ahead. They just wouldn't. And that doesn't mean that every sermon has to be you just railing on, you know, a certain political posture. It's not. But when we teach the comprehensive worldview, we're able to take the Bible, we're able to apply it to these issues. And I think Christians are longing for that. They want that. They want to hear God's word expounded to such a degree that they can deal with the issues they're going to face. And that's been the heart and soul of my ministry. And, and as I've tried to serve Christ as an under shepherd, I want to lead people into those into those pastures to, to sharpen our minds so that we can think theologically and you know uh, have a Christian or reformational philosophy, uh, a mind that can engage in the sciences and deal with all these topics. I think the church should be leading the way, and I think people are waking up to it. They just have to not. They have to remember, though, this is not just a left or right paradigm. It's not just a white black paradigm. Mm-hmm. It's it's bigger than that. It's a Jesus Christ is Lord versus the pretend kingdoms of man paradigm. And like you said, we have to have the boldness and the courage to to delineate between those things and and articulate it in a way that's hopefully going to be persuasive to people who may hear it. I think if you say it, and people know truth, they feel it, and that would be the the. The, the icebreaker, because we hear so much negativity. People are turned off to it, but they do understand reality and, and truth. And they do respond to a love, a loving way to express that. And we only have a few, uh, like a minute or so left, but I'd love it if you can lead a prayer at the end of the show so that we can wrap this up in something that's powerful and even more powerful than it's been. And I'd love to to have you, if you would, say a prayer for us. Sure, let's pray. Um, Father God, we come boldly into your throne of grace and mercy, knowing that uh, your people are in, in need of your grace, your mercy. The, the, the things that you are, we need that. And we pray that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our current and reigning king, uh, that he would be honored, that, that his, his uh, salvation would be declared and, and, and promulgated in the world. And I pray that you would, you would send your Holy Spirit to bring revival and reformation, um, but most importantly, repentance, so that we might be prepared for the days ahead, so that we can see the nations that you have purchased, Lord Jesus, with your blood. We can see them come to you and be healed. And that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been an honor to have you on, and I look forward to having you back. And People can, again, go to jasongarwood.com, and your book is The Politics of Humanism, A Christian Response to the Humanist Worldview, and people can get that on Amazon. So, Dr. Gardwood, thank you again. I really just love what you do. Thank you, Dr. George. It's a pleasure, as always, being with you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for living in the solution. Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times, Liberty Talk FM.